There are a few things as a pro wrestling fan you can never forget, and unfortunately, some of those instances aren't happy memories. One of these was when the legendary Eddie Guerrero passed away in 2005. Unexpected and just plain sad, most people can remember exactly where they were when they heard the news. It never really gets any easier. One of the finest wrestlers in history, he also had an incredible and fascinating story to the top. I'm Simon from What Culture. This is 10 Things You Didn't Know About Eddie Guerrero. Number 10. He was the first luchador in history to voluntary unmask. In case you don't know, the importance of the mask in Mexican wrestling is massive. It's not just a gimmick, but an important part of culture and history. Each mask has huge significance and is expected to be treated with respect. It's why a mask versus mask match in Mexico is huge. Once you've lost yours, that's it. You shall never wear it again. Eddie Guerrero completely understood this and followed suit, but was also one to think outside the box and come up with ways to get people talking. This is why he was the first luchador in history to willingly take his mask off. Wrestling as Makara Majika for EMLL before leaving after falling out with them, he popped up in AAA wearing the same hood, took it off before his first match, saying he wanted to continue the Guerrero legacy and make a mark under his own name. That was that and he was off to the races and making history in the process. Number nine, he was opposed to the light cheat steel vignettes. As we all know, Eddie Guerrero just came across as one hell of a likable chap. This is why WWE had to turn him face in the early 2000s after his run as a bad guy. It was obvious people loved Eddie, so they had to run with him. The way they did this was with a series of vignettes in early 2003 that showed him and partner Chavo, aka Los Guerreros, in a more comedic light, or more specifically, in a light where they would lie, cheat, and steal. So they cheated during a game of golf, stole some guy's coat, and hit on some women as they drove around in a lowrider. Everyone loved the idea, apart from Eddie himself, who thought it was disrespectful to the Guerrero name and refused to go through with it. It was only after the creative team convinced him it was the right move that he agreed. Surprisingly, they weren't wrong. Number 8. He was supposed to wrestle HBK at WrestleMania 22. Can you believe we never saw a Shawn Michaels vs Eddie Guerrero match in the WWE? Seems weird, right? Like something that people should have made sure happened. But we didn't! Their paths never crossed in the company, even though the end result would probably have been excellent. Someone did seem to know that mind, as it almost came to pass. Pitch shortly before Eddie passed away, the feud was going to start at the Raw Rumble before culminating at WrestleMania 22. Vince McMahon was exceptionally high on the idea, and video packages were even greenlit for production. It's even more sad is that the first tease would have been at Survivor Series 2005, just two weeks after Eddie died. Number seven, he was in constant pain throughout 2005. It's one thing to have to deal with injuries. It's another to deal with those injuries and yet somehow overcome them in order to put on incredible pro wrestling performances night in and night out. Somehow, Eddie Guerrero did just that. Having one of the best years of his career in 2005, Eddie wowed crowds as he fought Rey Mysterio, Chris Benoit and Batista. But behind the scenes, he was in a lot of pain, struggling with nagging issues all over. Batista himself even referenced this during the Guerrero Raw tribute show, highlighting just how much he worked through. Bob Holly even said in his autobiography that Eddie would be in agony on the trainer's table until 10 minutes before his match, before having an energy drink and defying all expectations in the ring. It's just otherworldly. Number six, he was relieved when the title was taken away. Eddie Guerrero was never meant to win the big one, or so people would say. A massive underdog in his match with Brock Lesnar at No Way Out 2004, it was a shock to say the least when he did win after an epic back and forth with The Beast. It was a great moment for Eddie and one he had worked his whole life to achieve, but with great power comes great responsibility, and it wasn't something Guerrero enjoyed all that much. With Lesnar out the door and Kurt Angle injured, WWE was short of headliners and did start struggling at the box office. This led to Guerrero taking things such as ratings and buy rates personally, and it affected him in the ring. This is why he was somewhat relieved when JBL won the title from him at the Great American Bash. Could handle everything else the pro wrestling business threw at him. This just wasn't his bag. Number five, he had backstage fights with Kurt Angle and Charlie Haas. During 2003 and 2004, Eddie Guerrero got into some kerfuffles with other dudes in the locker room. We'll start with the former. Exchanging blows with Charlie Haas following a match between Los Guerreros and Team Angle, Eddie claimed that Haas had ignored the fact he had separated his shoulder and continued to work it over anyway. There was a confrontation backstage and tempers flared, although the two did quickly settle their differences and stop trying to smash the other's face in. Then a year later, the same kind of thing happened with Angle. Claiming that Kurt was being too rough with him, the gold medalist responded by saying Eddie's performances recently had been lackluster, which set the Mexican off. He died for Angle's legs, but, of course, Kurt was an Olympic champion when it came to that kind of thing, so Eddie didn't get very far. JBL even brought this incident up in a blog where he recalled asking Guerrero why he ever thought this was a good idea, and Eddie simply replied, Because I'm an idiot. Number four, he was one of Batista's only supporters in the SmackDown locker room. Batista pissed off the entire SmackDown locker room when in 2005 he told the Sun newspaper that Raw was obviously better. 
wasn't even competition. So when he was drafted there, well, a lot of the roster didn't have any time for him. Big Dave even said that JBL sandbagged him in their title matches to make him look bad because of this. There was one guy who didn't act this way though, and his name was Eddie Guerrero. Supporting Batista throughout everything, Eddie even told Batista to leave a show to attend to a family matter and went as far as to tell the boys they should all get behind him. This soon translated to an on-air friendship in 2005 and a match too. It was all great. Number three, he almost worked a top-level program with The Undertaker. Despite working for SmackDown between 2002 and 2005, Guerrero and The Undertaker never had a single match against each other. There was a glimpse of the two working together during the Armageddon 2004 main event, the Fatal 4-Way, also featuring JBL and Booker T, and it was clear something was there, which isn't that surprising. They were two premier workers. All this led to, however, were some amazing house show matches in 2005. Former WWE writer Court Bauer said they were so good, it did lead some to propose a proper program between the pair. But it was nixed by Vince McMahon, who just thought the size difference was too much to overcome. Which is why he then booked Eddie vs. Batista a month later. Wrestling. Number two, his daughter wrestled in FCW. Wrestling is in the Guerrero family's blood. There's countless names associated with them, and this includes Eddie's and Vicky's oldest daughter, Shawl, who decided she wanted in as well. Performing under the name Raquel Diaz, she ended up in FCW in 2010 and made her debut in February 2011. She also managed the Ascension for a while and had a gimmick, where she dubbed herself as the Ultra Diva, where her aim was to get rid of the ugliness from NXT. Lovely. She left the company in 2012 before returning a year later, but unfortunately an eating disorder saw her depart for a second time in August 2014. Hopefully she will be back one day, especially as she's married to WWE superstar Aiden English. Doesn't really tie in, just thought you'd like to know. Number 1. He wrestled for Ring of Honor After he was released by the WWE in 2001, Eddie wasn't even sure he wanted to be a wrestler anymore. Struggling with aspects in his personal life, he went back to basics agreeing to do smaller shows around the country and even putting over the likes of Loki and CM Punk who, at the time, were the definition of up-and-comers. This then led to matches in New Japan as well as one for Ring of Honor losing to Super Crazy on the company's very first show. This momentum continued to build until he was rehired by the WWE in March 2002, but as he already promised Ring of Honor he'd do a second appearance, he turned up as the WWE Intercontinental Champion to team with the Amazing Red before vanquishing the SATs. He even gave a speech afterwards thanking the wrestlers and fans for their support, which led to the locker room emptying and hoisting Eddie onto their shoulders. It was awesome, and so was he. Know of any other facts about Eddie Guerrero? Let us know in the comments below, and remember to like, share, and subscribe. You can even come tell me on Twitter at Simon316 and follow What Culture at What Culture WWE. I'm Simon from What Culture, and I will speak to you again soon. It's time once again for everybody to buy a magazine, please. Yes, that's right. It's issue five of our wonderful magazine called Wrestling. And this one is an absolute belt. As you can see from the front cover, it features a massive career retrospective of the Olympic hero, Kurt Angle. Not only that, but it's got a how WWE should have booked the entire WrestleMania 32 card written by this six foot streak of charisma. The bulk of the magazine is this huge top 100 greatest Wrestlemania moments of all time list. Not just that, but you've got Shawn Michaels' crimes against wrestling. You've got the top 10 greatest wrestling managers of all time. You've got columns from Jim Cornette, Tom Pritchard, Shane Douglas, and an interview with the WCPW world champion, Drew Galloway. Issue 5 of Wrestling will be released on April 10th. You can pre-order it now at shop.whatculture.com. Oh, and about our shop, uh, we're currently in the process of moving all of our merch to a new premises. So shipping stuff like t-shirts, that may take a little bit longer. It doesn't apply to the magazines. Once you order a magazine, we will ship it straight away. But for any other items on our shop.whatculture.com, there might be a little bit of a delay for the next few weeks. But don't let that distract you from buying Wrestling. Buy the magazine. Buy it. Buy the magazine.